just want to welcome everybody to tonight's talk. Um, it's exciting to see you all here. Uh, this is our second uh, uh, talk in the lecture series this year for Sound Studies. Um, and I first want to just acknowledge uh, that we as uh, the Sound Studies Institute is part of the University of Alberta. Um, and we're located on Treaty 6 territory, uh, which is a traditional gathering place for diverse indigenous peoples, uh, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, and Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. Um, and I welcome you all here, uh, wherever you're from. Uh, and uh, if you don't know about the Sound Studies Institute, uh, we are a research institute at the University of Alberta that um, supports really any kind of research and creative work um, that centralizes sound in some way. Uh, if it makes sound, we want to know about it. Um, so SSI offers uh, our researchers opportunities to work collaboratively, um, discover new areas of uh, inquiry, um, benefit, we can sometimes offer administrative support and things like that. Uh, we have uh, some equipment that we loan out and workshops that we put on for learning how to do things like field recording. And uh, this year, there's a lot of energy around uh, podcasting, which is something that we're um, also getting into. So we just want to be able to provide a kind of philosophical and, and physical also locus for sharing and exploring and celebrating uh, um, sound um, in a collaborative way. Okay, so what uh, we're just super excited tonight um, to be uh, um, uh, hearing from Martina Kokunis Rappel, who is uh, the Dean of Science, and uh, she is, uh, uh, we're really excited to be hearing about her work with um, uh, bats and mice and the sounds that they make that we normally don't hear. She comes to us uh, from the biology department at the University of North Carolina. It, uh, at Greensboro, where she spent uh, 16 years, um, became a faculty member there, achieved tenure, held positions, uh, including uh, the director of graduate studies and the chair of the biology department there. Uh, and she has recently come to U of A, and we're very excited to have her here. She's an internationally recognized scientist whose research centers on the biology of acoustic communication in bats and mice, which you're going to hear about tonight, uh, two biodiverse groups of mammals that communicate using ultrasound. Uh, and uh, using innovative and integrated approaches in the field, she characterizes the communication behaviors of wild bats and mice at multiple scales and determines how ecological, physiological, and anthropogenic uh, effects mediate those behaviors under natural contexts. Um, and uh, some of you might know I'm a composer who's crazy about trying to hear things that we can't normally hear. Um, I had some really a lot of fun with some hummingbird recordings that I pitched down into the range of hearing and played around with them. So uh, I'm really, really excited to hear these sounds and hear about them and, and what they actually mean in the context of these wonderful creatures. So um, welcome to Martina and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. I, um, it, it's, it's a delight for me to be here. And, uh, you know, I am the Dean of Science. So I start all of my um, all of my talks, no matter where I am with this science slide deck. Um, and I know that um, there are people that are watching that are not from the Faculty of Science. And that is really exciting to me because um, I, I am excited to share what I do with other people um, on campus. So I'll take you through a little journey and I will do my best um, to keep this um, interesting for everybody, no matter um, which faculty or department you are um, in. Okay, so I'm showing some pictures here of the U of A campus, and um, the title of my talk, the, ti the, the title of the uh, first part is Listening to the Night. And, um, you know, at the U of A, I shared this with um, alumni the other day that, you know, I always like to be reminded why our colors are green and gold and, and this shows this perfectly. And um, we spend a lot of time outside during the day. And this is what, um, you know, if you're on campus, this is what you see during the day. And, and you can um, think about the observations that you make at a, at a small scale. So, um, you know, birds that are in the trees or squirrels that are in the trees, 
people, um, the plants themselves. And so you can look at a small scale at things and then you can kind of consider a larger scale. So let's say we're thinking about um, the ways that um, uh, a squirrel or a chipmunk are using um, these trees or the area right around the trees. And, and there are some really interesting behaviors that are just happening right within this scale. But then we can think about a larger landscape. And, you know, so these trees are somewhere here at the U of A, but then you could also think, well, you know, how, how would those animals be using the river valley? And, and what's the implication of, of putting um, the golf course here um, for those animals or, or some of these urban boundaries? And these are all really interesting questions. And um, these are all questions that you can relate to because this is what you see during the day. Um, but what I see is uh, something quite different because um, I start to wake up when the sun is setting. And this is, of course, my um, where my office is located in CSIS on the University of Alberta campus. And um, not only here, but no matter where I am, uh, I start, I literally start to get uh, pretty active when the sun sets. And that's because I've spent my career um, asking these kinds of questions that I posed here and at this landscape scale, but I do it at night. And so why do I do that? Why do I start to wake up at night? What's going on at night that's so interesting? And uh, what's going on at night is that um, there's a whole group of animals, um, in particular a group of vertebrates, uh, you know, related to birds, um, but they're mammals. And a majority of them are actually active at night. And we, we don't often think about that. Um, but but they tend to be active at night. And, and what are mammals? So mammals are those animals that um, have fur or hair. You know, I'm a mammal and, and you're a mammal. So we have fur um, or hair. Uh, we feed our offspring milk. And actually what defines us as a group is um, the kind of jaw that we have. So we have this jaw um, our lower jaw that we can sort of move laterally and we're the only group of animals that can do that. And so if you think about all of the mammals that are alive um, on earth today, and, and by when I say mammals, I mean mammal species. So if you think of all of the mammal species that are alive today, um, there's about 6,500 species and we are one of them. Um, and if, if you plotted their diversity on uh, sort of a pie diagram, um, there's really like tiny pieces of the pie where there's only one or two species of that kind of mammal. And then there's these like really big pieces of the pie. So these two big pieces of the pie make up like, you know, 60% of the mammals. So what are all these pieces? Well, um, these pieces are things that you would recognize. So like humans are here, we're primates, um, the carnivores are in here, um, rabbits and pikas are a tiny um, sliver here. Then we, there's an even smaller sliver that are the um, odd toed ungulates like horses and zebra tapirs and rhinos. And then this is a pretty big, big piece. These are the even toed ungulates like, you know, camels and cows and pigs and deer. Here's, no, here's another relatively big one, um, the shrews, the moles and the hedgehogs. And it's actually these little pieces that you see and are familiar to you during the day, right? Things like carnivores or these ungulates, um, uh, hares and rabbits. And, and sometimes you actually see some rodents during the day too. This is the, this big piece here, things like, um, you know, beavers and squirrels. But the reality is that you don't see these pieces because these are made up the majority of this big piece is made up of not squirrels or beavers, but rodents that we call, call um, uh, rats and mice. And, and the majority of them are nocturnal. So over 80% of this piece, you would only see active at night. And then this, this piece here um, are the bats and, and they are also nocturnal. So I'm gonna talk about these two groups which make over 60% of the mammalian biodiversity. And um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about each group before I talk to you about why they're really interesting and why it's important that we actually go out and we study them. 
So what are bats? And um, so if there are any bat biologists watching, just bear with me. Um, but many of you may not know this, but, but bats are mammals. So they have those characteristics that I just talked to you about. You know, they can move their lower mandible back and forth too, just like I can. Um, but what makes them bats is that um, they can fly. So they're the only mammals that have true sustained flight. And I'm going to show you, these are actually four species of um, bats. And I'm going to show these pictures over and over again. And they were, they're taken by um, Brock and Sherry Fenton. And they're just beautiful pictures. But I want you to focus on this one. This is a hoary bat, a bat that we have in Alberta. And it's uh, just a, a be absolutely beautiful animal. And it's called a hoary bat because its fur has... Um, tips, white silvery tips that look like hoar frost. So this is the hoary bat. But if you look over here, this is the wing and um, the coloration allows you to see something. So this is the bat's wrist, just like your wrist. This is the bat's thumb. Uh, this is the bat's uh, pointer finger, middle finger, ring finger, and pinky finger. And these fingers are just um, elongated and the skin that you have between your fingers um, just sp uh, spreads out to the end of these long fingers and that's what makes up a bat's wing so that's that's how a bat can fly and so bats are just those mammals that have these wing modifications and can fly the other group are the rodents but remember I told you that the majority of rodents are um, uh, bats or sorry rats or mice and i want to tell you what that actually means so so well what is a rodent um so bats are those mammals that sustain true flight rodents are those mammals that have two incisors so you have two incisors you know your two front teeth and then they have a big gap uh, so they don't have any canines and then they've got some molars and so what rodents are um, known for doing is um, having these extremely um, strong two incisors um, top and bottom of their jaw and they can chisel through things and then they can um, really chew things with their molars so that's what makes a mammal a rodent um, so that's what defines these two groups and both groups are really important. And I wanna spend just a couple of minutes talking about why they're important. They're actually important for different reasons. Um, and I'm gonna go through the rodents first. So both of them are important for the one reason I've already told you about, which is the high level of, of biodiversity that we have worldwide, right? 60% of all mammal species on earth ballpark are in one of these groups. So they're important just because they represent so much biodiversity. But then they're also important for um, roles that they play in our ecosystems and um, actually for economic reasons, so I'm gonna go through it. So rodents are ecosystem engineers, right? They have, um, they're, they, they're diggers, they're chewers, they're, they're seed dispersers, um, they, they literally, engineer our ecosystems through their activities. So uh, many of them, for example, are burrowers. So they're tilling the soil as they're behaving or they're dispersing seeds. Um, they're also major prey for predators. So you can look in food webs around the world and you'll find that rodents are um, really important as prey um, for higher level consumers. From an economic standpoint, um, I already said that they, they, they eat seeds um, and they eat other things too, but, but they're major pests in agricultural ecosystems. And I could have picked lots of different data to draw from here, but um, if we just look in South America, in any given year, five to 90% of total food crop loss can be attributed to what the rodents are doing um, in croplands. Um, of course, they're also really important and, and two out of those um, you know, 1,600 species are really important. Um, those are the lab mouse and the lab rat. So those are species of rodents. Um, that are our main model for human biomedical research. So, so th they're mammals, I told you that, uh, and, and that is the reason why they are often um, first steps in 
um, in many biomedical research projects because they're a model for humans. And then lastly, um, they're wildlife hosts of human shared pathogens. And, you know, think about rats and the plague, for example, but you could also think about um, things like hantavirus. Um, you could think about uh, COVID-19. Um, there have been isolates of SARS-CoV-2 and related viruses um, from, uh, from rodents and even the ones I'm going to talk about tonight. Okay, why are bats important? Well, bats are um, important because just like the rodents are important in food webs as, um, as uh, prey for consumers, bats are top consumers or top predators in many of the world's food webs as well. So they're top insect predators in aquatic systems and terrestrial systems. So at night, if you think of what is the top predator, um, it is bats and it's bats that are um, uh, eating insects for the most part in our part of the world, but they are eating other things in other, other parts of the world. So uh, they are also top pollinators in agricultural systems, and there are many uh, plants and um, foods that we would not have without bats. So um, plantains, which is wh what we get our bananas from, um, agaves, which is where we get you know, things like tequila from, um, those are exclusively pollinated by particular species of bats, and, and there is nothing else that can pollinate those. Uh, they have major impacts in agricultural systems as top predators. So um, you can actually see um, on radar bats that are moving through the landscape, queuing in on agricultural pests. And so you can think of some worms or caterpillars that are um, you know, feeding on crop plants. Those caterpillars become moths and um, bats eat those moths on the wing. And so I can tell you that, and you can believe me, or people can actually put the sort of the added value um, to that service. And um, there's a range around this, but uh, you know, per year in the United States, um, there have been estimates of sort of the added value of that service on the order of $22 billion per year. And that is just the um, cost of not using agriculture. That's, that's the actual cost of the pesticide um, that, that doesn't have to be used because bats are in the system. Bats are also important um, because of these services, but especially um, the, uh, there are many species in North America and elsewhere in the world that are threatened and endangered um, from several different factors, but a very recent one is um, white nose syndrome, which is caused by an introduced fungus to North America. And I, I don't have time to talk a lot about that, but um, there, it's important to understand um, the biology of bats to um, mitigate um, these, these things. And then, of course, bats are also wildlife hosts to human shared pathogens, including um, things like rabies um, and also some of the other um, viruses that we Come from become familiar with um, like MERS and SARS and um, COVID-19. So it, they're both really important groups and um, we can't deal with any aspects of um, anything that I've talked about if we don't understand their fundamental biology and that's, that's what I do in my research lab. So it's important to study them because they are important animals, but they're also really interesting in terms of the sounds that they produce. So both of these groups are mainly nocturnal and they're vertebrates, right? Just like you're a vertebrate and I'm a vertebrate. And um, we, have, we have eyes uh, that all vertebrates have and vertebrate eyes really need light to be functional. And if you're a nocturnal vertebrate and there are, is no light, then you have to use another kind of modality. And um, both of these groups of animals use sound. And so you may be familiar with echolocation. And this is a, this is a picture of a bat. It's a cartoon of a bat that's um, sending out um, 
calls through its um, throat, just the way I'm talking to you right now. And so the call is, um, is being emitted and the bat is um, listening for each of these calls to bounce off of an object in the environment. And then the echoes from those calls go back to the right and left ear of the bat. And um, the bat is processing that information to basically um, reconstruct in three dimensions uh, its environment and everything in its environment. And this is how bats find food because um, like that moth that I was talking about, echoes would bounce off of a moth that was flying. And also, um, it's also how they navigate through their environment. And this is called echolocation. And um, these sounds are produced above our range of hearing. And so, um, there are ways that we can eavesdrop on this and I'm actually going to play a recording of echolocation just like this cartoon is showing that um, I just recorded in my yard and I want you to um, look here. This is 20 kilohertz. Uh, humans can't hear um, at, at 20 kilohertz. We can hear down sort of in this range and any of this fuzzy, um, this sort of fuzzy green um, sound that you hear is my voice. And so this is uh, the, the range that I'm speaking at. And then you'll hear some um, chirps that are these calls that are reflected here. Okay, so um, I'm going to show you these some more um, of this later on in the talk, but each one of those calls you notice is around 30 kilohertz that um, it sort of goes from 60 kilohertz down to about 30 kilohertz and that is an echolocation call of a bat. Uh, but bats don't just make echolocation calls and not only bats make ultrasound calls so i'm going to play you another recording um just like the last one uh this isn't going to be in real time um, but i want to show you a couple of things so um this is a uh, frequency again here on the y-axis remember i said that you know humans won't hear um much above let, let's say even like 17 kilohertz. So you would only be able to hear what's down here. Um, and then this, this rest of this space is filled with these chirps, which are just like those echolocation calls that I showed you. But also this is a mouse call. So this is a recording uh, uh, out in the wild with only two individuals, one bat and one mouse. And of course, this has been sort of rendered audible for you um, by dropping the pitch um, so that we can hear this. Um, so what would have happened in one and a half seconds in the wild is being slowed down by like 10 times. So you're hearing that echolocation and then you're hearing an individual mouse, kind of this whistle sound. This is the second call and the third call. And this is the kind of mouse that is making that sound, a deer mouse. Okay. So these are sounds that are made by two animals. The bat is echolocating. The mouse is making a sound that is not an echolocation call, but a communication call. And bats don't only echolocate, they also make communication calls. So what I'm showing you here is a panel um, of um, the different kinds of calls that bats can make. So far, I've only talked about echolocation calls, but there are these other different kinds of calls. You can see how this is very different from the echolocation call that I played you. Um, this is kind of similar to the mouse call. And what the bats are doing with these calls is making these calls while they're flying to communicate with other bats. And here, the mice are also not just making these whistle kind of calls that I played for you. There's a complex um, group of calls that they make, and they're either making these calls to call out to a mouse who's far away, 
or they're making these calls to call to a mouse that is really close. And um, the, studying these kinds of calls and the functions of the calls are things that I'm very interested in. So why is studying these calls interesting, right? I've told you why the animals are interesting, but what about their calls are interesting? And um, you can really think about this as studying communication and why is communication interesting? And how does communication relate to an animal's biology? So we can take, let's say a mouse here or a rat, it's gonna make a call that's gonna go through the environment and there's an intended receiver and that receiver is going to then be behave and respond in a way to that sender's call. And then even some non-target receivers are going to behave. And this help us, helps us understand the biology. So I'll just give like a really basic example. If we're worried about crop failure or if we're worried about disease transmission, we need to know how these animals interact and because it's these behaviors that influence all aspects of their biology. So this seems pretty simple, but it's actually not at all simple because what really happens is that this one individual is making a call that's passing through the environment to another individual. And there are so many both biotic and abiotic factors that are gonna influence this communication. So what are some of the sort of biotic factors? Well, I call this in this cartoon kind of the internal scene of the animal. So depending on the animal's age, whether it has pups, whether it's male or female, whether it's the mating season or not. Also, um, the, those same things are gonna affect the receiver. There are also kind of external factors that are going to impact this communication. Things like the habitat. So what, what actually, what kind of vegetation is that animal in? And, and what's happening to the, that vegetation? Um, that influences the properties of the sound and the behavior. Are there predators around? How many individuals that are not intended targets around? Are there other communicating animals around? Like in this case, the bats. What's the weather like? Because um, this environment and the uh, environment that the sound has to pass through impacts the actual sound. And so what I'm really interested in my lab is not at all in the lab, but it's going out into the field to see if we can understand what um, uh, mediates communication behavior while accounting for all of these internal and external factors. And so how do we do that? So everything that I do is done outside. Well, that's not true. What I do in the lab is I process the sound, but all of, all of what I'm going to tell you about tonight is work that we do out in the woods somewhere. And we do this through something called mousing. And a um, mousing involves going out to a study site. Um, in the evening, we put out live traps. So here's a picture of a live trap. Then we go back a few hours later. So it could be, you know, nine o'clock at night or midnight or four in the morning. And we open up the trap and we see what is in the trap, what species of mouse. Here's two different species. You can just see that they're different species, even just based on their coloration. Um, every mouse gets a an ear tag that it's going to keep on its ear for its whole life so we can follow that mouse and know who it is by its ear tag. We take measurements, we identify the mouse to species, we might put a radio collar, a temporary collar on the mouse. Um, but the really the important thing that we do is we figure out what mice live where and then we put these tiny little microphones into their habitat. And these microphones um, in this case are literally wired through the habitat and there's a receiving box out in the field. Um, and this just shows all of the different microphones and the channels coming in. And we record all the sounds that are being produced. The sounds that are being produced by the mice that we've identified as individuals and we know who they are. Um, and also all the other sounds in the environment. And then we might also radio track individuals. So in this case, we're recording sounds in the field. And here is a student who is off on the side monitoring activity of a particular individual with radio telemetry. 
And so what we can generate from that kind of information, especially the live trapping piece, I'm showing you two different species here. One's yellow and one it has this um, purple around it, but it's um, represented by green on this grid. We, we put traps out all over the environment in a grid shape, and then we can map out where particular individuals live. And then that tells us where to put our microphones. And so when we do that, we record mouse calls. So this is another recording of a mouse call. And, and you'll recognize it's one of those long distance calls that I showed you. Okay, there's the second um, call in that sequence. Um, but we can also look at direct behaviors because what we also do is we put out cameras um, while we're recording. And this is just a video. If you've never thought about what a mouse looks like running around in the forest, um, we can see them um, and we can match the behaviors. The, here's the mouse, by the way, because it's a thermal camera. Um, and we match those behaviors with the sounds that um, we're recording. Okay, and how do we study bats? Well, bats, we can put up these big nets. This is the sun going down. So you can see again, this is starting in the evening. Here's a person scale. We can put up these massive nets and open them when it's dark. And then um, bats fly into the nets, because not because they can't echolocate the nets, but because they're not paying attention. They're just flying through the habitat that they know, and we've put a net in front of them, so we kind of catch them off guard. But um, we actually don't need to do that, uh, because just like with the mice, we can take those exact microphones and put them up into the environment where the bats are. So here's that same microphone up on a pole, microphone up in a tripod, microphone in a tree, and we also um, will put microphones on the top of a car and drive through um, areas that we want to sample with the microphone on top of a car. And so I'm going to show you a couple of recent studies and I'm not going to bog you down with a lot of data. I'm just going to show you how we use these sounds to study the behaviors of mice and bats at different scales. And I'm going to talk about some of those internal factors. So in this case, I'm going to talk about uh, the behavior of mice and how that's impacted um, by testosterone, which is an androgen that influences behavior, um, and how pups influence the behavior. Um, I'm going to talk about how noise in the environment influences the behavior of mice. Then I'm going to switch to the behavior of bats and talk about how, at a very large spatial scale, changes to the landscape can influence both behavior and diversity of um, bats. Okay, so I'm going to show you um, kind of snapshots. So how would we study something like the effect of a hormone on behaviors out in the woods if we're studying mice? So what we do is we um, basically study these animals without any manipulation. So just like I told you, we put microphones out, we put cameras out, and we study them without any manipulations. And then we have some manipulations that um, once we know what the normal behaviors are or the natural behaviors are, we look at the effect of, in this case, something like a hormone. So we identify mice in the wild, the particular species that I'm going to talk about here is so interesting because um, it forms long-term pair bonds. And so out in the field, um, you catch uh, pairs, uh, like a male and a female, that have, for the most part, mated for life. And um, you catch them in the same place. And this experiment was interested in the effects of testosterone and short-term uh, pulses of testosterone. So what we would do is we would catch them over five days. And over those five days, the male would either get sort of a control injection without any testosterone or a treatment injection with testosterone. And then what we would do is we would give them the injections over a few days and then stop and just let them behave naturally and see what their behavior was like on night one, night two, and night three after this injection. 
And what we found, I'm going to show you sort of two high level results um, on the y axis is the number of um, ultrasound calls that they produce. And you can see that there's a difference in that the mice that receive a pulse of testosterone call more. And these um, mice were given the testosterone and, and the control injections at their nest site. The other thing that we see is that um, we can measure how much time they spend in the nest. So remember I said that these uh, mice pair for life. Uh, the males actually take care of the offspring with the females. And so what we see is that the males um, time spent at their nest um, is different depending on whether they got a pulse of testosterone or not. So when, when they have some testosterone, they spend more time at the nest. So that's the difference between this line and this line. And then very interestingly, um, if there are pups in the nest, um, that effect is even stronger. So um, we see how the internal state of the animal affects, in this case, the behavior at the nest site with and without offspring and um, their uh, calling behavior through um, the ultrasound that they produce. We can also look at things that are happening outside of the environment of the mouse. And so what I'm showing you here is a forest floor where we know what mice are living here. And what you're actually seeing, um, this is in a really rainy, such an interesting part of North America. Um, it's a temp almost a temperate rainforest in um, the southern Appalachian Mountains. And you're seeing these plastic plates on top of those little microphones so that the rain um, doesn't keep tripping our microphones. Um, so there's a grid of microphones that are in this area. And actually right here, there's a feeding tray. And um, we put a feeding tray with some seeds in the tray because we can also look at, at the feeding behavior of, of the mice. What we were interested in with this experiment is whether or not the behaviors that we know to be the natural behaviors are affected by noise. And um, there are lots of reasons why we would be concerned about that, um, because we know that these animals are communicating with each other using sound. And we also know that um, we put sound into the environment and we want to know what the effect of that is. So here's the basic design. So we were studying two species of mice in um, this study. So that they're depicted by this mouse and this mouse. And what we did is we looked, these are sunflower seeds. So we looked and, and saw how many seeds um, these mice went and got at this tray. And then we also recorded the um, calls that they were producing. So that's without any um, noise being broadcast. And we did that for three nights. So we monitored everything about their behavior uh, for three nights. And then what we did after that on night four, five, and six is we broadcast sound. And that sound was of two types. Uh, we broadcast natural noise, and that was um, the sound of a creek. So we recorded the sound of a creek in the area, and there are ultrasonic components to that. Um, and then we broadcast that. And um, we also broadcast um, human-made sound. And this was from um, a generator that was used in that area um, for, for um, road repairs. And, and these are the results sort of in cartoon form. So what we found, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you this quadrant first, is that both of the species were still behaving in the area, but in the presence of natural noise, um, they stopped calling altogether. So they didn't make any calls and they actually ate fewer seeds from the tray on these nights. What we found when we broadcast um, human-made sound, this is the generator noise, um, something really interesting happened. Um, one species just left the area, the other species didn't leave. So, so we, we show here that the effect of noise is not the same on every kind of species of mouse, even in the same area. And in this case, the um, species that stayed, it also did not make any calls and it also um, um, did not consume the same number of seeds um, that were um, in that area. 
So, so this is um, this is showing uh, both effects of noise on both calling behavior and other behaviors, and really importantly, um, species-specific differences in how these animals respond to noise. Okay, I'm gonna switch to bats here and we're gonna jump up a scale. So, you know, here we're talking about just a few meters, studying a few meters at the bottom of the forest floor. Uh, and that's the scale at which we study mice. But when we study bats, we study that at a very large spatial scale. So this is the state of North Carolina, which is where I was. It's on the Atlantic coast. Um, here, here's where North Carolina is in North America, just to orient yourselves. And North Carolina is about a fifth the size of Alberta. And when we study bats at this scale, we put microphones all over the state. So everywhere where you see um, a box here, uh, we would be sampling acoustically. And we might be doing that with a microphone on a pole or a microphone on top of a truck, um, but we are recording using the exact same kinds of approaches just at a much larger scale. And so you see that we're sampling the whole landscape acoustically here, and we can answer some really interesting questions with these kinds of data. So here is the same picture of the state of North Carolina, and each one of those squares has these little blue bars in it. And every one of those blue bars is a water quality sampling station that the water biologists are monitoring. And they do this, um, the state of North Carolina does this um, sort of year over year to monitor the quality of the water in the state. And um, from this kind of sampling, they know that some of these sites have excellent water quality, some have good water quality, some have good to fair water quality, and some have poor water quality. And remember that bats are top predators in food webs. And water is the base of a food web for animals that are top predators in aquatic systems. So it's really interesting to ask the questions if bats respond differently to these different water quality sites. And we have the acoustic data to test that. We also can look at land cover over that landscape. And so what I'm showing you here is just two of those sampling squares, and those are 10 by 10 um, kilometers. And you can see these different colors represent different land cover. So where you're seeing pink or red, these are urban areas. And where you're seeing the other colors, that might be sort of agriculture areas or forest areas. And where you're seeing blue, it's water. So you can put those data into this kind of an analysis. And then lastly, you can also do something else. And you can put human data into the analysis. And so here are those same squares that I was telling you about. This one is showing land cover. Um, but what this one is showing is every one of these dots is a measure of median household income um, from uh, data that are collected nationwide. So we not only know about what the land cover is like, what the water quality is like, but also what kind of affluence is in the particular um, grids that we're sampling. And that's really interesting because um, there is evidence that, and it's um, called the luxury effect, that what humans are doing with the land that they are on um, and whether or not there's affluence associated with those humans impacts the biodiversity. Um, and you can think of something as simple as um, the kind of landscaping that someone who was very wealthy is able to do versus the kind of landscaping that someone who is just making ends meet is able to do. And so we can see how bats respond to that. And I'm not going to go into the details. These, this is, these are, I'm, I'm combining information from two different studies here. But I will tell you that we know that um, median household income is not associated with any specific land cover type. So we did that analysis. And we know also that water quality is not associated with urban land cover necessarily. So we don't have to worry about these results being confounded by the kind of land cover that 
is associated with either median household income or water quality. So how do the bats respond? So first I'm gonna to talk to you about median household income. And this is median household income in dollars on the X axis. This is bat activity on the Y axis measured as number of bat calls that are recorded per um, given distance. And then these are all different bat species. So, um, whoops. So here, uh, is um, uh, species that we don't um, see in Alberta. This is the species that we don't see in Alberta. We don't see in Alberta. We do see in Alberta. We do see in Alberta. We do see in Alberta. And we do see in Alberta. So I'm gonna take this back to um, some sort of local species in a second, but it doesn't even really matter what these species are. What matters is that each one of them responds differently to median household income. So this particular species, you see more of these bats in areas where the people have a higher median household income, as opposed to this species where you see less activity as median household income increases. And there are some species that are not associated with median household income at all. And there's different ecological reasons why that might be happening. But the point is that our acoustic sampling across the landscape allows us to address these questions. And some of these are threatened and endangered species and others are not. So what about the water quality? Well, I'm going to show you the results for that, and I actually am putting the pictures of um, the bat species that I showed you at the very beginning of this talk. So what you see here on the x-axis is water quality, excellent water quality, good water quality, good to fair water quality, and fair water quality, and the same variable bat activity on the y-axis. And I'm gonna focus in on um, three different species. So this is the big brown bat. And what you can see if there's a star right here, it means that that level of activity is different when you compare it to the excellent water quality sites. So big brown bats have a higher activity at good water quality sites than, big, than at um, good, fair, or fair water quality sites. So you're more likely to record a big brown bat over high quality water sites. Same thing for um, this bat here. Um, and you can see the same pattern, high and then lower. Silver-haired bat here, uh, you don't see any of these asterisks on top of the water quality site, so that means that this bat doesn't really care. Um, it's the same level of activity at all those sites. And I want you to contrast that with this species where you see these asterisks here, but it's actually the opposite pattern. So this bat actually is more active at poor water quality sites. And that might be counterintuitive, but you're actually less likely to find it where water quality is really good. And the reason uh, that we think that this is happening is that this is a bat that actually specializes on insects that emerge from aquatic systems. And aquatic systems that are of poor quality usually have lots of nutrients, extra nutrients in them. And there are more in different kinds of insects that emerge. So this species of bat actually um, prefers to forage over um, water quality sites that we might not necessarily think would be um, um, something that would be good for wildlife, but um, when in the context, um, they respond positively to them. The important thing is that this is a species that is heavily impacted by white nose syndrome. And so if we were trying to mitigate for mortality from white nose syndrome to try and sort of conserve populations of this species, we would have to take this water quality um, uh, result into account. Okay, so now I want to switch uh, in the last couple of minutes because 
Uh, I'm not in North Carolina anymore. And all of those data are from North Carolina. And we're actually still collecting those data at those sites. And we have a multi-year data set there. But now I'm in Alberta. And um, we can ask these exact same questions for both bats and mice um, in the province of Alberta. Now, I said, you know, Alberta is five times as large, um, but Alberta has uh, an amazing, Alberta is amazing in many ways. Uh, there are amazing bat biologists in Alberta that um, at these blue sites here um, have already been recording um, ultrasound produced by bats. So um, these blue sites are actually legacy sites where data have been collected in previous years. And then some of these red and purple sites sites are sites where um, my collaborator, Aaron Bain, who's also a member of the Sound Studies Institute, um, has also been collecting data. And, and he has sites and his group has sites all over the province. But this summer, we were able to go out and start some sampling. And I'm going to blow up this Grand Prairie region, which is shown here. And you can see these purple dots are where we had stationary sites. And um, these lines, these squiggly lines, are where driving transects were driven. And we have a new student who um, is going to start looking at these data, um, and she just started. And so I'd be really excited um, to tell you all about um, what we have been finding out in Alberta um, in the future. But for now, I just want to give you a bit of um, data and take you right back to where I started, which was the um, Centennial Center for Interdisciplinary Science on the U of A campus, where I actually, almost the day I got here, um, worked with Aaron and, um, and his group to put microphones up on the roof of CSIS. And so um, with one of Aaron's technicians, um, Hedwig, we set these up. Uh, on the roof. So here is the roof of CSIS looking north. You know, there's the biological sciences building and here's Oliver. And then if you turn around, um, here's the quad. Uh, but these microphones are also recording bats and they've been recording bats for over a year now um, through the winter, um, through all the seasons. And I want to show you just a couple of recordings um, so that you can um, get to hear and learn uh, the local species, which I've already talked to you about, because these are species that have distributions all over North America and are some of the species from the results in North Carolina. So I'm going to show you three recordings from the roof of CSIS. Uh, this is a little brown bat. This is a big brown bat. And this is a hoary bat. And so I want you to listen to the pitch differences. And you'll also see here, it's the same kind of a graph. Frequency is on the y-axis. So here you have a bat echolocating you know, over 40 kilohertz. Um, here you have a bat that's echolocating around 30 kilohertz. And I actually played you a big brown bat echolocation call at the beginning of the talk. And then these hoaries are down at 20 kilohertz. So let me play these recordings. And these are just echolocation calls. Okay, that's the little brown bat, the big brown bat. And the hoary bat. So you can, you, can, you can hear the pitch differences, um, but the amazing thing about using um, recordings to eavesdrop into the night this way is that we not only have a window into the sort of small scale behaviors that these animals are um, using, but we can use these different pitches to sample the biodiversity that is out there in the dark without ever having to handle an animal. So I think I'm going to leave it there because I've been 
asking for about 50 minutes. Um, I would be um, remiss if I did not thank all of the um, organizations and especially the people that were involved in some of the data that I showed you tonight. Um, this is Hedwig who um, has just done uh, the lion's share of work keeping the CSIS um, microphones going, um, Aaron in uh, biological sciences, and then these are former students and collaborators um, from uh, North Carolina and Wisconsin and Indiana, and then all of the um, funding agencies and um, cooperators. So with that, I'm going to, because I'm the Dean of Science, and with another science slide um, and I would be happy to take any questions um, or comments or criticisms um, that you have for me. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much for for this amazing talk. So, so interesting. Um, so yeah, we do have time for a few questions. A uh, couple questions. Um, just to, if you would like to ask a question, um, probably the easiest way to do that would be to just type it into the chat. Um, or if you'd prefer to, to speak, um, you can let, uh, let us know in the chat and we can just unmute you and, uh, and you, can, you can talk. Um, I do see that there is one question already in the chat, which I'm going to echo because it's a question that I had, um, which is sure. um, when, when looking at the anthropogenic noise problem, um, how much of the noise that exists is actually in the ultrasonic range? Um, and, and or I might, a variation on that would be, um, does it matter uh, um, greatly if it is in the ultrasonic range? In other words, if there's a lot of noise that's in the subsonic range from the point of view of, the, of these animals, does that seem to cause the same similar issues um, with communication? Yeah, so um, great question. And the answer is, uh, we don't know. So we don't know on the second question. Um, so, so the first, let me, let me, I'll treat both of those separately. So the first question is how much noise is actually in the ultrasonic range, right? Was that the first question? Well, so there's lots of noise in the ultrasonic range and um, actually that's a lot of it is natural. So um, if you just have a microphone out in lots of different environments, you're gonna get a ton of insect noise, for example, that's in the ultrasonic range. And, and that's noise for a mouse that's communicating at a particular frequency. If that insect noise overlaps with the frequency band of the, of the mouse communication. So we don't know the answer to that, but there is definitely a lot of natural ultrasound noise. Wind will make ultrasound noise going through vegetation, insects. Um, other animals. So, so that is definitely there. Um, and then there is anthropogenic ultrasound noise. Um, probably the best example is um, even if, if you um, just record a car braking, there is a lot of ultrasound noise associated with a car that is braking. Um, and, and so, but the, the real answer is we don't know. We, we are barely learning about the sounds that are being made at night by these animals. So we don't know anything about how the noise that's there is impacting the sounds, but that's exactly why we did that, that one experiment. And that's something that I will definitely be continuing here. I think it's a really important question. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Uh, that's a, that was great. Um, so uh, let's see, just looking at the chat here and Tom, let me know if I miss anything here. Um, I see another question about how do you, let's see, how do you find signals of interest in the recordings? Um, and I think that hours in hours and hours of recording and I, I know um, obviously um, I'm sure, I'm assuming that the microphones are not constantly recording that you have them set up in such a way that when something triggers in a certain frequency range that then it starts to record. But even so, you're, you're gonna end up with, in many cases, hours and hours and hours of recording. Uh, and so that's a, uh, the question is, how do you get at the stuff that you're looking for quickly? Yeah. And it's not hours and hours, it's hundreds and hundreds of hours and hundreds of thousands of recordings. So we do it in different ways. Um, so in some way, it's for, for some sounds that we really understand, um, we might have 
um, scripts or programs to sort of churn through the data to look for what we're looking for. Um, so we can, some of it is, is automated and, and we do it that way. But the reality for the rodent sounds is that we are still discovering what some of these sounds are. So we literally, depending on what the question is, um, we have, we in the lab sit and look at every single one of our recordings to make sure we're not missing anything. And then once we really feel like we understand those recordings, then we automate the process and, and use things like machine learning and other, other kinds of approaches to, um, to extract the information that we're really interested in. Yeah. Great. Um, let's see. So we are at 801. Yep. And uh, so I, I, maybe what I'll do here um, is, is take this opportunity to just thank you uh, so much for this amazing talk. Um, uh, we, it, was, it was just incredible. And uh, hopefully, um, hopefully all, all of us can go out and search for more of these sounds. Um, uh, and maybe um, uh, what I'll do is I'll just quickly um, mention uh, the, the event that's going to happen uh, in two weeks, and then maybe we can hang out for one or two more questions if, if somebody has a burning question, and otherwise um, we, can, we can call it a night. But um, so uh, am I still on? Something weird happened with... No, you're yeah. still on. Good. So, it looks so I just want to say one thing really quick that yeah. I see that... Um, Cami Hurtado is here and she's the graduate student who's going to be looking at some of these sounds. So maybe you can even hear from her once she gets through some of her data. So, and I think I also saw that um, that Hedwig is here and Hedwig helped collect some of these data. So we'll, we'll come back and talk about this more. I guarantee it. Fantastic. Hi, Jimmy. <laughs> Okay, well, um, so just quickly, uh, for those of you uh, new here, uh, it's great to see you all. Um, if you uh, want to just take a look at the Sound Studies website, we do have a page dedicated to the lecture series. Um, and the next one is on October 14th, uh, Wednesday, same time. Um, and we're going to have a presentation by uh, Ariane Smith Piquet from CKUA Radio, and she's going to be talking about um, the, uh, the, some of the archives and musical artifacts, ephemera, et cetera. Um, uh, in working through uh, the, the library uh, there. And so that should be really exciting. We um, have a, a long relationship with CKUFA, or CKUA. Um, uh, so hopefully we'll see some of you there. And uh, just checking the chat one more time to see if there's any burning questions. I, I guess maybe I'll, I don't see any more. Uh, maybe I'll leave us with one sort of oddball question, <laughs> if, if you don't mind. Um, which is just, uh, I'm wondering a little bit about, um, in, in various studies that's been done, um, one, one thing I, I noticed, and maybe this is like low hanging fruit, but uh, just when I was doing my own searching about this and, and interested in, in general, I came across something that I had seen before about rats laughing. Mm -hmm. um, and about the, the, it had it was a study about tickling rats yeah. and how that they yeah. it, it brought me it made me wonder a little bit about just the whole idea of emotional expression in these animals and the fact that we don't yet have any way to really get into the psyche of these animals and understand what it really means to be laughing mm -hmm. um, and whether that maybe is actually some form of torture or something. It's, it's just hard to know like what chemically yeah. is going on. So yeah. I just, I just wanted to, to ask if you had any, uh, it, it had looked at all at emotion um, in, in with these sounds and how, how you might be able to divine information about, about what they're feeling. Yeah. So I actually, um, yeah, it's a, a really good question. And, and actually I, I, it looks like I can't go back, but um, so when I showed you the panels of the different kinds of um, calls that both rats and bats make, um, I said that, you know, these calls are like for long distance and these calls are for short range. Well, when we study the behaviors, we know exactly what's happening when those calls are being made. And so some of those calls we know are about sort of negative situations. Some of those calls we know are about positive situations. And in the case of mice, for example, when a mouse is being chased by a predator and it makes 
a sort of call, we know that there's sort of a negative there, there is something bad happening. And if when you study these calls over and over and over again, there is always something negative associated with that call type, then you can say, you know what, that call is associated with a negative affect for that animal. And or that call is associated with a positive that there's a sort of positive affect that's going on. And the the rats giggling um, we actually know this, these, the very interesting thing is there is a long history of a study of ultrasound in uh, rats and mice because they are lab animals. And we know a lot about positive and negative affects and the kinds of sounds that are made. And the giggling sound is associated with positive things that are happening. And we know enough about the behaviors that are associated with that sa those sounds that we can say if a if a rat is vocalizing at this frequency, it is a negative. There is something negative happening. If the rat is vocalizing at this frequency, there's something positive happening. Or we can at the very least say this is a positive affect associated call or a negative affect associated call. And those are what those giggles are associated with. <laughs> Wow, that's, yeah. that's so. So the bottom line is we know because we want we we look at the behaviors and and the patterns of the beha of the behaviors that are associated with the calls that are being made. So great. Um, we do have one more uh, quick question about the hormones. The question about whether there are um, are call uh, changes in call responses. Um, when other hormones are used other than testosterone, if you've looked into those, like other. So, so there's actually a whole literature, not only, so the calls, I guess it's important. They're not, the, they're not calling in response to those testosterone pulses. It's more likely that the testosterone pulses are affecting behaviors that are associated with those calls. So I think it's really important um, to, to, put, to, to frame it that way. And um, there are, uh, testosterone is, is probably one of the um, more well-studied hormones, um, but there's, there's just a huge literature about how um, the hormones mediate different lots of different kinds of hormones mediate behaviors, and some of those are associated with calling. Hmm. Okay. Um, if it's all and about- And one more. Oh, they're, they're, oh, they're just trickling. That's a really good question. Mark has a really good question. Yeah, he's asking about the frequent, um, if it's all about frequency or if there's associations with rhythmic characteristics of the sound that you get. Yeah, that's such, that's such a good question. So it is not only about frequency. Um, it's about frequency. It is also about amplitude. I didn't even talk about it, but you probably noticed that some of those, even the echolocation sounded quite loud versus not very loud. Um, and I was, for example, mostly showing uh, one call and not the whole sequence. So something else that is very important is how many calls are in a sequence and how that sequence is timed with other sequences. And so we're just learning about that. Um, and there's almost certainly um, components of um, the ordering of calls, um, the rhythmicity of the calls, um, the amplitude of the calls, it's all important and we're just scratching the surface on understanding this. And I think the really critical thing here is that we don't even have a full repertoire of the kinds of calls that these animals are making, not bat, not for bats and not for mice either. And remember that um, there's, you know, uh, probably on the order of 1800 species of rats and mice, I showed you what maybe four of them do, four different species. So, so we just don't, I mean, I could, I could spend the rest of my life doing this and it would be hard to get at Mark's question, but there are lots of people interested in those, um, in those aspects. 
Speaking of frequency um, yeah. and just, and, and just the, the fact that you're measuring something outside of the range of hearing, um, I'm assuming that you have to use equipment that, that's capable of doing this. And I'm, I'm, I'm asking this question partly because I know that there are some in the audience who, who are thinking, oh, like I'm gonna bring my Zoom out and try to capture some of these things. Yeah. And, and sometimes you can get at some of that, but I just wanted, because I, but I, have, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the equipment um, yeah, sure. for, for getting at these sounds. Yeah, so, and that's really good. And I actually, it's upstairs. Um, near my back door and I could actually show you what one of the things that I use. Um, so there's, there's a couple of, there's a couple of things that are happening. So the microphones are all microphones that are, are um, specialized in, in having um, sensitivities at ultrasonic frequencies. So special microphones and very high sampling rates to capture that high frequency sound. So the processing is, is at a very high sampling rate. Then there's the um, processing again at a high sampling rate of those recordings to look at the sound. And then there's also different ways of um, resampling so that those sounds can be played back in an audible way. So lots of things going on there, but the reality is that there's really off the shelf, um, you know, for a couple of hundred dollars these days, uh, off the shelf microphones that you plug into your phone and you can just go walking out at night and sample broadband ultrasound. And the recording that I played, um, at the very beginning is just me sitting on my porch um, with with my iPhone and um, and an off the shelf uh, bat detector. So yeah, and I see I see at least one comment in the chat about like someone who's ready to go do that. So just just uh, from my experience, which is very minimal, um, I have been able to capture. Um, hummingbirds and other things um, around, uh, usually it caps out around 30K, maybe 40K with the microphones that I'm using. Yeah. Uh, if I'm recording at 96 kilohertz, it's easy, or 120, 92, even better, it's easy to scale that down. I find that the limiting factor, of course, as I'm sure you know, is just the microphones themselves. And it's, uh, they do cap off, they're designed to really, uh, and um, and then sometimes also the um, some recorders I think also have some filtration that they do before the fact and automatically filter those things out. So you yeah. have to read your manuals and see what it can do um, uh, for those people who are interested in doing that. But yeah, for sure. Yeah. But but the zoom yeah the zoom recorders are actually really good recorders um, for yeah. for capturing that. So okay, well this is this is just um, oh and just to answer. Uh, oh, and Tom has a question about uh, the usual sample rate you're using. Is it 100? It's higher than that. Yeah. Higher than that. Yeah. Usually higher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because remember that. Um, so. Nyquist frequency, whatever the the highest frequency you want to record is. Right. right. Yeah, and and that can get up for for many of these bats. Um, well, for enough of the bats, and actually some of the mouse sounds, you're talking. A, it, it could be just sort of south of a hundred kilohertz. Yeah, that's really right. Yeah. Really yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But okay. really and truly, um, this is just the start of me introducing myself to all of you. If you have other questions, just um, reach out to me and I look forward to continued conversations um, about all of this. And I'm glad to just have sort of opened the window for um, everybody to sort of see what I'm listening to. Well, that's great. And um, I can tell also that we have some, we also have some community members joining us tonight too. And so that's really exciting. So just keep, you know, uh, we'll, we'll let you know next time we have uh, more to say about this subject, um, but please please do return to our website um, to see what else is going on this year. Um, we're also hoping to have a couple of workshops um, uh, and uh, some other events that aren't quite on the schedule yet, but um, thanks everyone for coming um, tonight. This has just been fantastic. I'm gonna go to bed and dream about, um, uh, in a good way, uh, mm -hmm. mice and rats tonight, I think. Perfect. <laughs> so. Thank you so much for hosting Scott and the Sound Studies Institute and everybody for your time and attention. It's been a real pleasure for me. Thank you too. All right, everyone have a good night.